Griselda Pollock, can I say your birthday? Na, nasce nel 1949 eh, in Sudafrica, ma eh, si sposta molto presto eh, in Inghilterra eh, da giovane e studia storia moderna a Oxford tra il 67 e il 70 e poi studia alla Courtauld Institute dal 70 al 72. Sebbene la sua carriera inizi con una tesi di dottorato su Van Gogh e l'arte olandese, eh, in realtà eh, la, è nota per, quest, per i lavori molto molto importanti attorno al riposizionamento della, delle figure femminili innanzitutto di artiste nella storia dell'arte come i suoi precoci lavori su Mary Cassatt ma poi successivi e più recenti su Eva Hesse, um, Braha Ettinger, il prossimo libro su Charlotte Solomon e no, la nostra amicizia è legata proprio al lavoro attorno a Charlotte Solomon eh, che eh, mise in evidenza nella documenta del 2012 e attorno alla figura di questa eh, artista invisibile morta incinta di cinque mesi ad Auschwitz lasciando un patrimonio incredibile di disegni eccetera ha scritto Griselda un libretto per la documenta che poi diventerà un prossimo libro eh, tra eh, un anno e, già completato e, tante cose sarebbero da dire non è soltanto stato, stata una questione di reinserire figure di artiste e donne che erano escluse e devo dire che eh, non, nelle biografie non è scritto, ma da questo punto di vista eh, la, il primo testo che pubblicò nel 1974, ancora molto giovane, su Spear Ribbons, era, la sto, era un elenco praticamente di tutte le artiste donne che erano negli storages della National Gallery, nei depositi della National Gallery. Ciò, quindi, diciamo molto anche diretto come operazione, ma si tratta non solo di un lavoro di quel genere, cioè di dare visibilità a donne artiste, all'interno delle metodologie storico-artistiche sviluppate da quello che è stata una storia dell'arte nata nell'Ottocento e sviluppata nel Novecento eh, principalmente da uomini storici dell'arte. La sua opera è stata anche quella proprio di modificare le metodologie e il modo di pensare a che cosa è la storia dell'arte attraverso dei principi femministi. Il suo libro più noto, non vorrei prendere troppo tempo, è naturalmente Vision and Difference del 1988 che è è proprio un milestone, un punto fermo nella storia dell'arte moderna che inserisce proprio questa prospettiva femminista di cui ci parlerà in parte. Ho menzionato Mary Cassatt ma naturalmente aveva scritto anche da giovane su Bert Morisot e altri. Quindi io direi che forse basta così. E passerei la parola a Griselda Pollack, uh, avete la possibilità di ascoltare la sua conferenza con le cuffie perché c'è la traduzione simultanea, parlerà in inglese. la mia conferenza in italiano, italiano. Nel passato 40 anni fa ho parlato l'italiano abbastanza fluentemente, ma il mio italiano è la lingua di una ragazza di 20 anni. Non potevo rischiare a pensare i pensieri di una intellettuale femminista veterana nella lingua che ho imparato quando erano una au pair, lavorando a Fano, per l'estate 
o attraverso la lettura di Machiavelli per i miei studi, studi di storia all'Università di Oxford. Quindi, con scusi, parlerò, eh, parlerò in inglese e conterò sull'ottima capacità linguistica di un traduttor traduttore dedicato. Oh, grazie tanti. Ok, so that's my Italian for the evening. Um, I, I think it would be such a pity to such a beautiful language to have just spoken as a teenager. Thank you very much, Carolyn, for the invitation, and thank you very much, all of you, for giving up your evening to come and uh, listen here and to consider these issues relating to the question of thinking with feminism. So, my questions. Uh, what is feminist thinking? What are feminist effects in art and thought? And what is a feminist affect? Not an effect, but an affect. What does it do to us when we engage with the questions that feminism has posed in terms of the way we understand ourselves in the world and understand the world? The lecture today is going to actually be about an artist that I'm interested in learning to understand more because I also link being a feminist with understanding that we have to decenter Europe we have to grasp the sense that we belong in a world and that artists from many different places in the world and many different times of those places in the world speak to us about the world we share. They're not labeled as other or different or exotic or from another place, but they speak from their own place to us and we can learn. So my notion of what I do is that I work in International Postcolonial Queer Feminist Studies. Now, we are in an art museum, and in particularly art museums have tried to tell us a story of art. But this museum is different. It's quite clear that this museum is asking you to think with art. And I am going to give you an opportunity to join me in what I call my virtual feminist museum. This is because, because uh, there's a result of the fact I'm a feminist. Nobody gives me the money to make the exhibitions I want to make. So I've invented this place for myself where I can put together the conversations between works from the past and the present and create contexts in which the kind of um, work that certain artists are making becomes legible. <coughs> So I'm going to invite you to uh, another installation in the uh, uh, Virtual Feminist Museum, which starts with a visit to an actual museum. Now, while I was pre preparing for this lecture, I went to see the British Museum in London. Actually, to be tr honest, I needed the toilet, so I went <laughs> into the museum. And as I went down looking for the washrooms, I passed their exhibition of the Cycladic sculptures. Now, I've always been very fascinated by these often tiny, very simplified figurines, standing, they seem, as a way they with these very simplified faces, often clutching their bodies. You can see why collectors at the beginning of the 20th century were so fascinated by them, when they saw Brancusi or Modigliani, they realized a sympathy, an aesthetic sympathy between these 3,000-year-old objects and contemporary modernism. So these were taken in great numbers from the islands, the Cycladean islands, to the extent that the graves from which they were found were robbed, and we no longer have the archaeological evidence to establish what they were for, where they were found, how they were laid. So, of course, museums get little metal clamps and little rods and try to make them stand up, even though it's clear when you turn them over that they are not in the round. In fact, not even are they in this little family group. The reason is that they are being claimed to be the 
predecessors of classical Greek art. The great standing figures of the Koroi of the archaic and then classical period of Greece, which gave us the major figure of standing man, Apollo, here is the Apollo uh, at Olympia, and of course the famous Apollo Belvedere, where man stands up, commands the universe, has uh, becoming bipedal and upright, has the hands free to move and the head can survey the entire world. This is partly in order to make sure we don't think that Greek art comes from Africa, which of course is the origin of Greek standing sculpture, are the great Egyptian sculptures. But in the 20th century, the Cycladic art sculptures were used instead. Now my view is that the sculptures should be seen on the horizontal, that they are in fact grave goods, and they lay on their backs with the masks on their faces, gazing up through the earth that buried them. And here's my little Cycladic sculpture that I have. It's not a real one, it's a copy. But I lay it down on the stone in my office. Now, why does this matter? You'll see, OK? Because if we now jump from 3,000 years ago, back through the museums, to the middle of the 20th century, we will remember the great gesture of the American abstract painter Barnett Newman, who simply by making a single line in the middle of a painting established an issue that he would then give a, to which he would then give a name, that's called Onement, when he made several of these lines and called it Via Heroicus Sublimus the sublime and heroic man. And this is not the human being, this is vir, this is virile, this is the word that gives us the man. Now the Greeks did finally, after several centuries, come up with a standing female figure, but very soon she closed her body, she crouched, and when your Venetian colleagues, the other side of the uh, island, uh, peninsula here, took her up again, they laid her down and put her to sleep. Now what I'm trying to do for you is to build a certain feminist structure around these two axes, the upright and the vertical. Now, this is the classical heritage. When we move into the Christian heritage, we realize how crucial this up vertical is to the very theology of Christianity, which moves between the sinking body of the dying Christ to the resurrected body of the rising Christ. And for a brief moment, when Protestantism starts in the 16th century, we have this bleak vision from the German artist Hans Holbein of what you almost never see, the actual in-between, the stages of the dead God, the dead Christ in the tomb. Now, Julia Kristeva, the French uh, literary or Bulgarian literary theorist who lives in France, has written a great deal about the Holbein uh, painting. And I want to stress this to you because the axis, the horizontal axis, is the axis of sleep and the axis of death. Let me just find what I want to go to here just to get myself in, in this one, okay? So what happens at the beginning of, of the modern era is this vision that Holbein gives, which refutes the two uprights by making us contemplate the possibility of the death of God. So Julia Kristeva reads this and devotes this a chapter to Holbein's painting as the figuration of the dark, unattended, unwitnessed, and very rarely represented a moment of entombment. She places the work in the cultural and historical moment of the 16th century of European humanism and the emergence of Protestantism. And Hans Holbein the Younger is the subject of this moment, the intellectual, theological, and artistic subject who creates for us not only a desolate, lonely image of the derelict dead Jesus, but also, in a sense, introduces the notion that there is no release from death. Death is going to claim us. 
So in Holbein's confrontation with this entombed body, Kristeva senses humanization at its highest point. And she concludes that Holbein's village vision is the Renaissance vision of man who is now subject to death, embraces death, absorbs it into his being, and enjoys a desacralized destiny that is a foundation of a new dignity. Now, what I'm trying to do by linking these uh, works together is actually create a kind of what I would call in German a builder atlas, a series of images by which you begin to not think, oh, this comes from 3,000 years, and then this is the Renaissance, and this is uh, Catholic, and this is Protestant, but to see in certain ways in the collection of the objects that we can bring together in my virtual feminist museum, a set of issues around these two axes, the most fundamental issue of uprightness, and of course, because we become upright, we also then have the notion, a human issue of what happens when we are horizontal. And I'm borrowing this way of thinking from the German Jewish art historian Abi Warburg, who at the beginning of the 20th century wanted to change what he called aestheticizing art history that spoke only of styles and periods and forms and focus on the image of the image of something, but the very notion of what is an image, what is a figuration, what happens when we use either the actual highly sophisticated representation of a body or even the fundamental schema of simply the horizontal line as we saw in Barnett Newman, what is being conveyed? Now, Warburg's argument was that the image is a trace of a memory and it's a memory of an action that was once performed. And the gestures that were performed in ritual were the gestures of the vulnerable human being in the face of forces they could not control, but on which they depended. So the production of, of the result of this affect of anxiety, of vulnerability, was to produce rituals by which you could pacify the gods of the sun or the gods of the wind or the gods of rain or the gods of the earth in order to somehow negotiate your own fragility in relation to your ultimate dependency on the earth. So the whole idea of imagining and projecting anxiety into the form of figurations, <clears throat> imagined figurations, started with worshipping trees, eventually we get these trees become standing figures. Apollo is obviously a very late development of a, a tree, effectively. But this is the important thing, and that the image is why the past remains with us, why we don't just simply say, I'm not interested in Cycladic figures or Greek figures, is that images are in some sense like batteries. They are stored up intensities, energies, passions, that relate affectively to the condition of human vulnerability in the face of the world. And it's a vulnerability that is experienced in the body's vulnerability and is articulated by this ritualizing of gestures which ultimately become images. And then the images transmit the memory, transmit the intensity. And he called this the pathos formula, the formulation of, of intensity. So my work, is, as Carolyn has been mentioning, is, is a question of methodological exploration. So Abi Warburg is one of the companions in my intellectual journeys, as is Sigmund Freud, because I think it's very significant that psychoanalysis was created in the presence of images. <coughs> Freud was one of the great collectors of antiquities, and the antiquities stood on his desk. They watched him as he worked. Greeks, Chinese, uh, in a certain sense, um, Roman, Latin, Greek, and things. None of the ones from Africa, none of the ones from Oceania, none of the things that came to inform the 20th century modernist imagination. The other person who accompanies me is Julia Kristeva and her very profound thinking about the question of revolution 
and poetic revolution, particularly, and the painter Bracha Ettinger, who is also a theorist of subjectivity. And I create different kinds of conversations between them, but also very complicated and unpredictable networks. This helps me produce an idea that what I'm studying is time. And I think one of the great feminist issues is the question of time, not clock time, not industrial time, not productive time, but the time of, of living, obviously, the time of dying, and the time of our sense of the past by means of memory, and our sense of the possibility of the future, which is the ethical call to us to have some sense that the world will go on without us. So instead of the melancholic image of Holbein that we will die and God has died and we have to internalize death, the feminine as a particular position, not as an attribute of women, but as a position, is articulate precisely in the sense that you accept that life will pass through you. And if you accept the concept that life will pass through you, that you're part of a chain, you have, in a sense, a constant ethical responsibility not merely to the past, which is what all our historical things, but to the future. So I think feminism is the future. And feminism hasn't happened yet. We have made various attempts over 2,000 years to dislodge the patriarchy. We got very, very powerful in a collective movement in the 19th century, again in the late 20th century. But my notion is that feminism is to come. And what I'm trying to create in my work is encounters in the Virtual Feminist Museum that will convey this sense of the unrealized potential. So far from knowing what it is to say I'm a feminist, I'm in the constant process of trying to find out what it is that this kind of thinking is calling upon us to do. So that's why I present myself not as a feminist art historian, but as someone who performs feminist interventions in arts histories. Two more things before I get to the meat of this lecture. Something very extraordinary and historical happened around 1960 to 1970. Namely, that art met feminism. Now, you might think that's just not a big issue, but of course, in all the history of women's challenge to the phallocentric or patriarchal ordering of the world, there's the asymmetry that makes man the subject and woman the matter or object. There have been f women philosophers like Diotima. There have been women poets like Sappho. There have been women in the Greek and Latin tradition of poets, in, in the Chinese tradition, in the Hindu traditions, all the way through the medieval Christian traditions. There have been moments of intensity, whether it's the poets of Venice in the 16th century through to the pre Puritans, on the way, we can find this challenge, but in no point had there ever been a specific encounter between that way of thinking and the image. There'd been feminist literature, feminist philosophy, feminist theology, feminist science, but not any kind of feminist theory of the image. But when art met feminism, it met after Auschwitz, it met after a particular catastrophic transformation of the conditions of human living and dying, when for the first time, in the words of Jürgen Habermas, the solidarity of all that bear a human face was systematically, industrially breached by a modern state. So people have been beastly to each other in many ways, but this is a particular event in human history. So that the nature of the entire legacy of the classical heritage of the image from Greece, which was reclaimed by the Christians, taken up and they academized and made the symptom of the modern world, is shattered by what was really done in terms of that event. And I think that event accounts for why in the 20th century art took a curious turn from the 40s, 50s onwards, great paintings, great sculptures, we think of the great heroic age of painting, and then by the 60s, we make a turn. 
And it is at that point that feminism met art when it made the conceptual turn. So when we try to situate this moment of feminist thinking, we have to grasp that something radical happened in art which would shift from certain kinds of ways that you would make images using the repertoire of the sculptural and uh, representational systems or rejecting them to the whole dimension of body art, performance art, conceptual art, time-based art, and the specificity of this transformation of European and world art after 1960 with into the conceptual turn, with the moment at which uh, feminism meets art and art meets feminism, there is a mutual transformation. Now I want to get past that. My work has been for 40 years how to think that. Not simply to do more and more art history, but how to find concepts with which to think what happens when this challenge to a monumental history of human thought, which we call the phallocentric, occurred in the historically specific conditions of historical catastrophe in the 20th century and the historical shifting of the very legacies of the tradition of art through the great moments that we name by different movements, but I'm going to call the, the, um, the conceptual art. Now, that's very brief, just to try to cover this, actually I want to go back one more, let me just go back here. These are my books, and they don't look like monographs, they're not you know, feminist art 1970 to 99, you know, or they're not about styles. Each title is a concept, conceptual intervention. Old Mistresses is an intervention into the language which proves that the language in which we speak of art cannot speak of artists in the feminine. Now, I don't know if this works in Italian, but we have, I think you have it, you know, the maestri. Vecchi Maestri is a sort of term, but you turn it in English to mistresses, you're talking about old ladies who are no longer useful in bed, right? There is no equivalent of the term of respect for the great men of art when you turn it into the feminine gender. Um, vision and difference, why would vision have be the site of difference? How would we theorize that? Generations and geographies, which is how do you confront the question of globalization of art, but much more importantly, the polit politics of the post-colonial. So the notion is all artists are simultaneously uh, operating at the axis of time, <coughs> historical, generational, familial, and geopolitical space, because they may not, they may be born in Delhi, but actually live in Berlin and exhibit in Seoul, right? This is not, we don't want labeling people and making them sort of as if they are passport carrying artists. Differencing the canon, how do we then deal with the art that we inherit? We have to introduce and recognize difference was already there, but it was repressed in the monocultural, monoethnic, monosexual stories that have been privileged. And so it goes on to my virtual feminist museum. Okay. Now, I want to introduce into my museum now some thinkers. Uh, you just briefly saw Hannah Arendt and Gayatri Spivak, which I'm going to move on from. But one of the key thinkers that is helping me in thinking through what I want to present tonight is Ellen Sixou, the French uh, uh, writer. She is not a theorist, she's a writer, a novelist or just a writer, but one of the very early books that she wrote in the 1970s called La Jeune May, The Newly Born Woman, returns to a different a repertoire or archive for thinking about these questions, which is stories, and particularly fairy tales. So I'm going to quote from what she says. I made use of the story that seemed to me particularly expressive of women's place, the story of sleeping beauty. Woman, if you look for her, has a strong chance of always being found in one position, in bed. In bed and asleep, laid out, she is always to be found on or in a bed, 
Sleeping Beauty is lifted from her bed because, by a man because, as we all know, women don't wake up by themselves. Man has to intervene, you understand. She is lifted up by a man who will lay her on another bed so that she may be confined to bed ever after, just as the fairy tales state. And we have enough of these reclining ladies in art. And so her trajectory is from bed to one bed where she can dream all the more. There are some extraordinary analyses of Kierkegaard on women's existence, or that part of existence set aside for her by culture, in which he says he sees woman as a sleeper. She sleeps, he says, and the first love dreams her, and then she dreams of love. From dream to dream, and always in the second position, Now, this leads us to go right back in time to a much more ancient culture, a culture that precedes the phallocentric, a culture in which a different set of images were created, and mostly created with the earth or on the earth in those Neolithic periods about 3,000, 4,000, 3,000 before the Common Era, mostly in central parts of Europe. So this is one of the largest man-made mounds and I love the phrase, this is the last man-made mounds made of chalk in Britain, in the south of Britain, belonging to a whole sequence of traces of this Neolithic time. If we look at it from the air, you may begin to see that it's not just a castle, it's actually the swelling of a certain part of what is potentially a figure. And if we push it a little bit further, you can begin to see that it's actually a reclining figure and this period of the silvery relates to what has been found, this beautiful, but of course she's a sleeping woman, uh, from Malta, from 3,000 years ago. Now, one of the uh, Latino-American uh, queer artists, Laura Aguilar, has used this tradition to allow a space in these nature self-portraits where she lays herself on the earth in this position in the fullness of her mature, her opulent, and her queer body. In a series of extraordinary photographs, which follow a long tradition of women placing their bodies in different ways in relation to the earth and to natural forms. And here is a photograph of her. This relates to another artist, a Cuban artist, Ana Mendieta, who was in exile from Cuba from childhood, growing up in Iowa, which is extremely flat in the United States, and who uh, devised a practice of performance works, which also then developed into the creating verse images, imprints of the, hum of the female body. But again, I'm drawing your attention to the way in which they use the horizontal as opposed to the vertical. Here, you're looking at it from above, and again, people trying to make that. Possibly one of the most famous figures of women lying down, but not asleep, is by Niki de saint Fal, the French artist, who created a Hon, woman, in 1966-7, which was a vast body which you could enter. And in the various swellings of that body were cafes, museums, cinemas. Very fascinating use of the interior. So if I were to make my next page of the Builder Atlas or next room, we might begin to think about something about the significance of this sequence of uh, the sleeping beauties, the reclining, but all versus the different ways in which this could articulate. Now this is all in fact a preparation, a preparation in order for us to see a work by this artist that I want to introduce to you today, who is called Sonia Kurana. Now, she has a link with uh, Torino because she has exhibited uh, in Torino. She is an artist who grew up in northern India. She trained in uh, London at the Royal Academy, or she trained in Delhi and then at the Royal Academy in London, like so many artists from the subcontinent. She then studied at the Rijks Academy in Amsterdam, and both the Royal Economy Academy and the Rijks Academy in Amsterdam are very hot houses 
for young artists. Many who've been to that academy in Amsterdam go on to become the big players in the international art world. But Sonia Kurana did not want to join the art world in 2002, an art world that for almost 10 years had seen itself becoming more and more penetrated by money, more and more uh, a major kind of market. So she set, stepped aside and stayed true to a particular series of practices which have led to her being recognized by many curators including Carolyn knows her, etc., but also Okri and Wezo chose her for the famous Guangzhou Biennale of 2008, but she's shown in Shanghai and Aichi, and obviously Guangzhou uh, at different triennials. And I, so she's an artist who has a place in this non-commercialized um, sense where she gets commissioned to do various things. So I'm interested in her from a feminist point of view because of this ethics of being, and I want to begin to show you something about why her work would fit into this. Now this is a piece that she did called The Flower Carrier, which is inspired by the novels by Milan Kundera, in which at a moment of absolute psychic anguish, a young woman deals with it by buying a flower and staring relentlessly at it, literally focusing out on everything. So the performance piece, which takes a while, shows Sonia Kurana having bought a flower, but in fact it's a plastic flower, that she is going to just focus on while she walks through Barcelona. Of course, to do so involves the interiority of dealing with an anguish by means of this intense concentration, while being in a public place that will be indifferent to you, and ultimately she then sits for a very long time in this space. Now, of course, this is filmed. It's not by chance, it's not incidental, it's documented, and that's part of how we become the witnesses to it, not the spectators of it. But what fascinates me is the moment at which she changed the axis. At a certain moment, about 2006, she decided to lie down. Now, the enormity of that is not only when we have a kind of Holbein-like sense of collapse, that you literally give in, and that the horizontal becomes, in a sense, the point at which you just want to lay down your burdens, you just want to lie down and die, or lie down and sleep, and lie down to escape. But she didn't do that. She did this in a very particular way. So I'm going to show you uh, the performance piece. I think, no, I'm going to progress.
while it's running through, I'm going to make some comments about it. Sandy Purana has been exploring a range of performance practices and the potential of the moving image as a language for the last 16 years, culminating with this project that uh, I'll really come to about sleeping. Now, one of the fundamental feminist questions is the question of being in the world, and being in the world in terms of not just one, but multiple differences. Being women in a world of men in terms of public space, a very significant one. Being a woman out of place because you come from a different continent. Being a woman out of place because you are a woman of a certain size, a woman of a certain age, in terms of particular kinds of styles we hear. So, Karara is posing in our, the mechanisms we have for being in the world as embodied subjects, where the world is a structure of spaces, projections of our bodies, and also places we create to protect the vulnerability of our bodies, which can be injured by what Italian philosopher Adriana Cavarero names as it were, the ontological crime of our era, violence against the unarmed, the inerme. She's been developing a language and a process for inquiries through these issues through a combination of real-time performance using the body and highly edited reconfigurations and self-conscious presentations of the moving image to create a grammar of the installation that mediates our encounter with an artwork. When she decides to lie down, she encounters the problem of images of the female figure on the horizontal axis, which are part of the formal processes of gendering the body in the imagination and the imaginary. As I've suggested, sleep, death, and the feminine are linked. But what is it for a woman to lie down in public, to lay herself on the asphalt in a city such as Barcelona? in the first decade of the 21st century. Does the, song, the logic of the birds, which is the name of this piece, does the solitary woman in shabby clothes lying on the ground, swamped with pigeons, invoke or evoke the abject, the rejected, the dejected, the abandoned, the relic, the rags, a body become matter without subject. Now, of course, there was a camera person filming, giving some indication to passers-by that this was not a person who had died on the streets. This was not a homeless person, quite like the darkness, sleeping in the sun. Nonetheless, the artist performed a transgression of norms by lying down, by being horizontal, not in her home, not in her bed, but in public space. As you'll probably have noticed, during the performance, she lets a mount of bird seed out of her hands, releasing it slowly, drawing the birds to her. Now, in India, pigeons are not considered urban rats, as they are in the US. There's no song like poisoning pigeons in the park, if any of you know Tom Lira. So the version of these birds will vary culturally. But the birds mediate the lonely woman and the crowd. They alone touch her. Corona has obviously waited a long time for an invitation to do this performance by lying down in the Piazza San Marco in Venezia. And I was just thinking in Turin, that's a very nice, but there weren't that many birds. Now the work questions what it means to do a private act by lying down. And eventually she divested herself of the pigeons and took up lying down in places of resistance, such as uh, the Place de la Bastille, or the India Gate after the independence celebrations in India, in Delhi. She applied to do it in Tiananmen Square, but was refused permission. Now, I want to just go through some of the elements of this exhibition, of this work with you. Um, just to raise some of the questions that it asks. Now she is asking, can a body in performance make a claim on public space? Can it presume public space is given, that it is already public? 
Is it possible to use performative gestures to make contacts across boundaries, cultures, and genders? Is not the struggle over what will be public space, in fact, a struggle over the basic ways in which we are, as bodies, supported in the world? A struggle against effacement and a struggle for a space of appearance. So I want to take you through some of these issues that this work raises. Now, of course, if any of you have traveled in India, you will know that one of the features that strikes Europeans is that people sleep in the streets of their cities. There is widespread homelessness, and the legacies of imperial British architecture is wide pavements and wide boulevards between, you know, pavements between the boulevards, where you largely see either men sleeping or families. And where you see them families, they are encampments. This is their home. And public space in India is entirely masculine, uh, as we know from the terrifying rapes of women who dare to try and claim it. So this is an important uh, element of it. But what is she doing here in terms of recent debates put forward by a number of philosophers in relation precisely to the question of resistance? Judith Butler has recently given some lectures on the notion of vulnerability and resistance, that in order to resist, we make, have to make ourselves vulnerable. We have to go into public spaces where we know we are going to transgress and may be hurt by the police, dragged away, be, there, must, there might be violence in the manner in which the state responds to us. 